I kind of want you to write notes. I'm going to start questions. What do you think would be a good midterm question? Um, 
I'll read through them. If somebody writes a good question, I'll give you a boost on your midterm for having good questions or based on them. So it'll be a double, it'll be attendance points. So make sure you put your name on it. And then um, if you have a good question or you put a good topic onto it and it gets picked and it shows up on the midterm, then you'll get like, I don't know, some percent, what? What did you say? Points. So, um, all right, let's get started. Let's get started today. So, we're, today we're going to be talking about DNA repair. So, the very important thing is we're going to be talking about ways your DNA can get damaged, and then we're going to talk about the different mechanisms for you to actually fix it. Right? So, for this. Let's get started. All right. So we have different ways that your DNA can get, can have errors or can get messed up or things that can go wrong. Right. So in some cases, we're going to look at some of this, right? Let's start at the right side. You have replication errors. When your DNA is trying to get copied, remember your polymerase, it's going to grab on and it's trying to add and copy the new bases in. At the first level, you have, you know, the base pairs have to match up properly in order for them to keep going. Um, but sometimes there, there are events where you accidentally move a mistiming. So if you have a G, for example, you throw in an A, it's not going to want to bind up. If the numerous keeps going, you're going to have two bases that are not going to be happy with each other. Right? So that's one kind of error we're going to deal with. And I'll show you some really cool mechanisms that the cells have to make sure that when you have that type of mismatch, the cell literally tries to get rid of the new DNA and not mess with the old DNA. So a bit of a so now that's going to be cool. On the other side, going this way, when you look at chemical exposure, Normally, these things are going to be, again, emphasizing on your DNA strands. These chemicals like to bind to the, to the nitrogenous base, right, which is normally your ATCG, right, where you have the things. These chemicals will go and it'll try to bind there. When they do that, they're going to affect the way that sequence works. Either when you're going to replicate it later on or when you're trying to make something out of it, you don't have the right base pair. Um, the other thing that happens with those chemicals is that they can also change the composition of the little groups that are attached to the nitrogenous base. So each one of those bases, A, T, C, G, and U, they have certain amine groups or hydrogen groups sticking out. If you mess with those, you're going to change the letter, and then you have to find a way to fix it. So we're going to go a little bit through that. And then on this side, we have the bigger damaging things, right? So ionizing energy and UV light. So for these, is, these are high energy particles, and they basically affect the bonds. The cool one I'm going to really get into for this one is going to be that Finding dimers are going to be going down from this side. Yeah. So those are going to be the big layers we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to go that much into the cellular metabolism. But let's go. All right. So again, for today, I want you to be thinking about what part of the DNA you're zooming in or where we're affecting things, because you're going to see we have different ways to fix different things. So in this first case, all right, this is kind of like a chemical modification. There's your nitrogenous base. There's your cytosine, right? And here's that functional group, the amine group that we did. It's used to define that exact base pair. If you have a deamination de de event, you're basically getting rid of that amine group. Now you have an oxygen group. Now that new molecule, the molecule actually looks like a uracil. So if you can imagine you have two strands of DNA, all of a sudden on this strand, everything's DNA. On this, on this top strand, if that base gets modified, instead of having a C, you can now switch yourself to a U. Yeah. So for this, and if you go, um, that means to remember this kind of stuff from like bio 133, which is uh, to remember it's pyridine, right? This one, they basically have one circle, one circles. and then the ones that are part of this one is going to be our C, our U, and our T, right? Then you have your purines. These ones you have two circles, and here you're going to find the A. And the G base pair. The other thing you guys need to remember for these is A pairs up with T, and then G pairs up with C. Everyone kind of remember this a little bit from the intro bios? Yeah. No? What do you mean? If not, this is my shortcut. It's to make a pyramid, you have to cut one stone at a time, and there's a word cut. So C, U, T, the three bases are going to be part of your pyramids. They're only going to have one circle like this. Very nitrogenous base, right? For the other ones, the AG, that's what I'm like. Your purines, these have two circles like this. Yeah. And nobody can team them up. To make your DNA, it's always one purine, one pyramid, right? So you can see there, 
Pyridine, 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 pyridine. Yeah. Question over here. Can you say something over here? No. All right. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? We had a question. I don't have a question. <laughs> Statement? No, no, no. I was just going to ask what the circles were, but I realized that. Yeah, so if we do the drawing, if we zoom into the DNA, right, it's like um, the five prime side, you have your phosphate group there, right? From there, you kind of, it kind of branches off like this, and it should look like that. So to make DNA, with the phosphate group. This is going to be our sugar, right? So this makes it like the uh, ribose. Um, you count these starting from this side. So this is your first carbon, second carbon, third carbon, fourth carbon, and fifth carbon, right? So when we normally talk about the DNA, we start off at the five prime side, is where you have your phosphate group. And on your three prime side, here's where you have this first OH group, which we normally use it to link up to the next phosphate, basically, right? So the other one, P would be here, right? One, two, three, four, five. And here would be the OH. And this is how we can basically do from the five prime to the three prime side. One week after one week. Yeah. Then on the right of this, off this first carbon, this is where you normally have what are called the circles, right? So this either can be like those top ones, which would be your pyrimidines. So that for that, it would be this guy's just one circle, and it's the three letters C, U, and T. Yeah. Or you can have the purines, which are going to be two circles, and that would be your AT molecules. Yeah. Does this make sense to everybody? Flashbacks. Okay. Back from 133. Not let me know, and I'll throw in some slides in here talking about them. The critical thing here is here, whether you have a circle, all right, I'm going to do the, the rough drawings. Or you have your two circle version, right? The important thing here is, or the naming is, we call this your nichotomy space, emphasizing the, the circles. That's because normally they have those nitrogen groups on them. Yeah. Each one of them has a specific pattern, kind of like you can see that top one, the N, C, and H. When you're looking at the DNA, those are the ones that are kind of sticking into the center of your cables. Those are the ones you normally use to match up with your opposing partner. So CG has three, three of those bonds are used to link both of those up. A and T normally use two of those molecules to interact. So when we mess with those groups on the outer edge, you're basically messing the way it's going to be able to create a partner. Yeah. So yeah, nitrogenous base. The other thing I'm going to talk about is going to be if we incorporate this and this, I think this one's called nucleoside. And then we're going to do something that I don't want to do. Let me say this. Nucleotide, nucleoside, and nitrogenous base. Oh yeah, what a pass. We're good. Yeah. So when we're talking about the nucleoside, we're talking about the sugar ring, and we're talking about the nitrogen space, right? If you're talking about nucleotide, then we're trying to bring in, we're saying that even the phosphate could be in it. Yeah. So this one we're talking about the nucleotides, it's like that whole thing. This is going to be important because in the next things, when we're going through the different uh, repair mechanisms, we can actually fix it at different levels. Like if the and the cardinal space is wrong, we can cut them off there. If um, we can also cut them off from like this part here, we can cut at the phosphate, cut it at the hydroxyl, and you get rid of the whole thing. Yeah. All right, I will find a prettier picture, I'll color code it, and I'll put it in for today's stuff. But let's get back to this guy. So, error wise, first error we're looking at is going to be you're messing with these circles, right? You're going to cause this space. So we're switching their letters in the DNA, which is super, gonna be super messed up. The other one here on the right, you're looking at the UV exposure. 
light comes in, basically two molecules of the thymine next to each other end up reacting across this, basically these two blue sides they connect, right? That's when you get this dangerous thing, which is your cyclobutane ring. At which point, your DNA molecule should be, you have a base pair sticking out. It should be interacting with its complementary strand. So now instead of interacting this way, they basically unplug and interact with each other, right? Which is gonna be like a vertical interaction which you don't want. And then this is kind of like a chemical reaction, right? You have your regular base. Here again, one of those important functional groups, which is your uh, H3N, that's gonna get modified by a chemical. And now instead of having that, now you have this whole thing being here, right? Normally when these two pieces of DNA are interacting, you use these two, so you use these two amino groups, basically interact with the, the methyl groups, the CHs, right? And that's the way they link up. And then this oxygen group reacts lastly with that NH3, if that's their connection. So if you imagine the whole point is to link up like this, the moment you have this, now you have this huge molecule in the way, it's only hard for that DNA to, to hold this at this proper shape. Yeah. So how are we gonna fix these guys, right? Oh yeah, sorry, one more that could happen also is again, chemical reactions, we're messing this up. Look at this is the fourth one, which is depurination. At which point, you're accidentally cutting this right here. And you're basically releasing this, right? So if we drew our little drawing of DNA, you basically have like A, T, C, G. And in one of the bases, you would have a phosphate, you'd have your sugar, but you wouldn't have a letter in it. Right? At which point, again, you gotta destabilize your DNA drastically. Yeah. How would the chemical get to the DNA? Would it have to like somehow slip through the nucleus? It has to get through everything. Okay. Uh, you know, you smoke a cigarette, they show up. Uh, you, um, there might be, um, let me think this one. There's a dye we normally, we used to use in the lab a lot. It's called thinium bromide. Like it has the ability to bind DNA and it goes and it does that, it sticks to those things. Um, they're pretty good at diffusing, right? And if it's in your food or if it gets in like, you contaminate yourself, it'll literally in your environment, it'll get, it'll, it'll, you'll absorb it. Well, like most things aren't able to pass through, but like nucleus, just these ones are, so they're able to get to the DNA. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are small enough that they go through a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the other one is like, uh, depending on what, how much concentration you have in the environment, it'll give it a bigger driving force, right? Like if it's like you're in a whole pool of water and someone only puts one drop of, of, of like one of the dyes, the force of it trying to get into your cells is gonna be weak. But if we get like a whole, like a bucket of the chemical and dump it in, then it's, it's gonna have a bigger driving force and it's easier for it to penetrate more stuff. And then we have our blood system and our limb system which are literally just pipelines connecting everything you have inside. So if you eat it, if you breathe it in, if it goes over through your skin, like that is gonna diffuse everywhere. Yeah, so they're super powerful, yeah. Good question. All right, so fourth damage, we can mess up that base pair. Um, so our cells are normally getting attacked all the time. So here's some values. You don't need to memorize the table in the sense of like, however many events are happening, you know what's going on. You don't need to know them, just appreciate that there's a lot of the, this, these things happening on, and we have to be consistently fixing them in order, in order to be okay. All right, so those are the first errors I went through is ways that they can get messed up because of our environment, because of light, because of chemicals. The other way that I told you that DNA can get messed up is when we're actually copying it, right? So it's gonna be our errors during our replication. So in this case, the orange one is the one that we're copying from, right? That's our template strand, there we're copying the DNA. And normally, again, your A and T's should be pairing up. Did put any CG's here? All right, um, that's all right. But if you incorporate the wrong base pair, you'll get something like this. Because the amine groups don't no longer line up, C and G, C will not interact with A. It won't be happy, it won't make that nice bond across the two different strands. Some polymerases, at, at this point, they have a mechanism where they can They'll try to fix it at that time point, right? The polymerase basically has the DNA holding onto the double stranded and it's adding a new space, a new base pair as it moves forward. When this happens, because they don't match up properly, the DNA kind of gets swollen. So it's like, it, it like it's trying to hold on, it'll swell it up. That makes it think that something's wrong. And that's where normally the polymerase itself will try to back up and it's called uh, three to five prime exonuclease activity. 
which means it can, it's, it's going, normally it's traveling five prime to three prime, but literally it'll back up three to five prime and exonuclease, it'll literally cut off that base pair to get rid of it because it thinks it's wrong. Which is, let me see which one picture for that one. Did I rush it? Oh yeah, sorry. So we're going here, you put in the wrong base pair. Because you put in the wrong base pair, the DNA feels it at the same time, you can't really keep going forward and adding new bases, so it gets stalled. The polymerase starts doing its job, right? So the next one doesn't want to come in. And then here, there's your three to five prime exonuclease activity. <coughs> you walk back, you cut right here at the phosphate, right? You're getting rid of everything, phosphate, sugar, and your base. There you've kicked off your C base pair. And now you have a shot to, again, you backed up. Now you can start moving forward again to finish copying the DNA. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so this one is, here it could happen at that time, but it'll try to repair it at that same time while it's still building one of the strands. So here the information is, one strand is complete. The other one that he had, uh, polymerase has access to the three prime side. So he can know which is the new strand, which is the one to mess up. This is what happens if, at which point, you kind of don't know anymore. If imagine he tried doing that, but somehow the polymerase just kept getting it wrong and it just left. It keeps adding new base pairs, but he left one mutation behind something like this, right? Then wherever there's a mismatch, there's different mechanisms that normally come in to try to repair this. In this case, they're showing us with a uh, deaminated C. So remember, if you mess with the C, you mess with the little bases out here, we can turn a C into a U, right? So let's say the green one, that's gonna be our good DNA or the proper DNA that was there. We've messed up this U mutation, but it should have been a C. Now you have the, these two possibilities, right? The DNA will go, it'll try to clean these up. When it's doing that, um, or when it's replicating, you're copying it, you're gonna end up doing this. This strand will give us an A strand, while this one, this G, will, will have its pair being made and it'll give us a G. So that mutation occurs, Depending on what DNA strand you copy from, it'll give you different sequences at that same sequence. Yeah. Um, yeah, some repair mutation accumulate. Uh, the other one here that's important is, so in this case, these depurinated A, instead of modifying the base, you actually completely cut it off. So now you don't have it. So at this point, it's like, here it's fair game to whatever's gonna be getting kicked in, right? Um, for the T, for sure, we're gonna get an A if we do this strand. For the top strand, you're basically leaving it open and it'll do this little cutting thing, right? So it'll be a little bit shorter. because It'll try to glue back on itself. Um, I'll find a really cool picture of this one. I've seen it before where they have the actual base pairs look shifted from each other. And it kind of like, they're normally evenly spaced out and it'll curve in like this into itself. But, so missing the base pair, mutated base pair are really gonna mess us up. Problem is, when we start making more and more copies, it's gonna get worse and worse. So, all right. So, those are the mutations. Now, why are the mutations so important? If they happen in our genes, and we look at exactly at the parts where um, we have the biggest function coming out of our genes, which is where we're gonna make the actual RNAs, which make our protein, right? So for this one, you guys are going to have to make a little bit of a jump going from, you have your whole DNA, if the mutation lands on a gene itself, it's going to switch the base pair there, right? When you go up to that, it's going to get turned into RNA. Um, and when it gets into RNA, you're going to have the next step translation kind of turn this into an amino acid. At which point, remember, the big thing for amino acids is it's coded every three base pairs. So ATG gives us one amino acid to find, right? GAC will give us, uh, I think D is a acid, I don't know what D is. I forgot what D is, guys, but whatever, three bases equals one piece of amino acid. When these mutations happen, depending on what they do to that spacing of three, for example, in some cases, we can get these things called side mutations, which is these three base, base pairs. Sometimes there's overlap, like CAA and CAG will still give you the same amino acid. Normally, when the mutation happens on the third base pair, that back end has a little bit of wobble, so you'll be okay. So, side mutation means the amino acid, Q is still the same, right? Point mutations can normally happen in the first and second. That's where the amino acid will be more sensitive. 
If there's mutations here, you end up actually switching the amino acid at that spot. Right? So you can get a different one. And there's only one special type of this that has its own name, which is um, the nonsense mutation. And that's if you turn that three, three base pair code, you can actually turn it into a stock code on it. And your whole protein actually stops at that site. You know? So I normally like breaking these up in the midterm. So put a little note on these guys. Presentations are important. The other one is kind of like we talked about where we lost the amine, the thing was cooking onto itself and we lost the base pair. When you do any insertion or deletion, because our code is based on three bases, if you accidentally add one, you basically shift all the groups of three, right? In which case, normally here, you're gonna get some wild thing happening. Sometimes the protein gets longer, sometimes they get shorter, like a stock code arm will show up. Sometimes you get some crazy amino acids and more cold happening. So these are gonna be the big problems. And for us, this means that if this mutation landed on an important gene, something critical to your cells, critical to your body function, and you lose it, like your cells are going to be like, like pretty badly regulated. This can kill your cell body. Yeah. After, like, when you were mentioning mutations, if there's one where it just deleted the group, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there any way to fix it after the fact? Like, can your body recognize, like, oh, this is messed up, or is it just kind of screwed forever? Let me see. There's ways it can try to catch it. The close one, it's gonna be using basically these kind of tools will be the ways to, to start trying to fix it on early, right? Um, that means that hopefully you'll know which is the, the good strand, the bad strand, try to get rid of one of them to keep only the good one, and then you have a shot. If that doesn't work out, normally what's gonna happen is, or we hope that that messed up protein that's coming out afterwards we're hoping that your protein system is going to, the ER is going to catch it. And hopefully that they can be like, oh, this is a misfolded protein. They'll try to fold it. It doesn't work out. And then they'll try to dump it to degradation. So at least one of your bad copies get completely destroyed. And you're hoping that your other copy, like from the other genes, is holding you up. Yeah, but if not, then yeah. Bad. So let's get now back into fixing them, right? So we can mess up, again, we can mess up the base. We can mess up, sorry, modify stuff at the edge of the base. You can mess up the base itself. And now we're going to get first into how are the ways that we can fix those type of things. And in this bottom part, we're going to be looking at what happens when instead of messing with just here or maybe all the way to here, it's what's going to happen when our DNA cables will then actually get disconnected from each other. So it's going to be two ways we're going to fix them. For the first one, we're going to be looking at, um, at, a, at a mismatch event, right? So here you have your old DNA strand. Here's your new one that we just finished making. Our preliminaries ran through this site, accidentally put the wrong base pair. Now we have an A, right? Old DNA normally has built up modifications on it or stuff that's been signaled to the old DNA. And one of the things I want you to notice for this one is going to be these methyl groups. So in our old DNA, we'll find methyl groups. In the new DNA, you won't. Then there's these complexes. Here we're going to talk about these different uh, mutt proteins. I believe in the book they call them... Um, Um, I believe these are UBR, A, UBR, B, and UBRC, but I'll bring it back in case I'm wrong. We're basically you grab on, you'll figure out that that DNA is kind of stretched out on itself because it can't bind properly, it's not properly coupled. So you have these first two grabbing on, recognizing that, and then the big player is going to be this guy, this mutt H. Right? What it does, it's going to go, and it's going to cut the new strand. So it will cause a single strand of DNA break. So the top strand is still intact. Now you have a single cut side here. You then are going to do another cut on the five prime side. Sorry, five prime. Never mind. One side and the other side. Basically, you're going to cut around the mutation itself. After you do that, your exonuclease is going to come in. And you're going to dump that piece of DNA. Now you're going to have an empty hole, right? At which point we're going to use the same machinery that we used before. We we're talking about those um, Okasagi fragments. Remember, you have to bring in the polymerase. The polymerase will come in, fill in the base pairs. Right, I'll be doing the polymerase. Fill it in. It can grow grow from five prime to three prime. Once it gets to the last one, it doesn't have the ability to glue the DNA by itself. That's where this next molecule, the ligase, comes in. You just basically glues the last T to the A, the last little molecule. Yeah. All right. So one way to fix it is 
for this uh, strand directed mismatch is we cut out a piece of the whole DNA, we replace the whole thing, right? The other way to do it is instead of tackling a huge fragment of DNA, you can just go and hit one exact base pair. In this case, we have that mismatch right here, that U to G. And this time we're going to be working with a glycosylase, right? And what this one's going to do is it's actually going to cut it right here. So when you do the cut here, it'll leave behind your sugar, it'll leave behind your phosphate group. But that basically that, that new circle is going to be this one, right? Once you take that one out, you're going to have this little blank spot, right? Either you're going to be missing a pyrimidine, so those are the ones we call apyrimidic, or you're going to be missing a pyrimidine, which is called uh, apyrimidine. Um, then this will be a specific enzyme that goes to that spot, and it just does this. It gives us that little nick to start opening up that piece of DNA, and then we're going to actually going to get rid of well, this would be your sugar and your phosphate backbone. We're going to cut that off, and we're going to get rid of that base pair. Once you have a hole within this double stranded DNA, these two guys are basically going to come into the picture. So the DNA polymerase acts the base that you need, but it can't glue it. The analogies comes and glues the last phosphate to the three from hydroxyl. Yeah? So pretty much a similar mechanism at the end. In the beginning, it's just whether you cut one base pair or you cut a whole strand of them. Here's another error we talked about earlier. This is the one where UV light comes, hits two neighboring thymines, right? In this case, remember, the goal for DNA normally is to be attached across the double strand, the double strands. That UV light hits it, now they interact with each other, right? Five to three prime, they'll be actually two neighbors playing with each other, which is something you don't want. The DNA is not gonna be happy, the shape's gonna be off. So for this one, it's doing a similar mechanism to the first one. So you're gonna have a protein complex come in, it kind of recognizes, um, this is the shape of the DNA. You're gonna have your helicase it's going to get recruited. You're going to open this thing up, at which point here you're going to have your enzymes that are going to go ahead and cut surrounding the mutation, and you're going to dump it out. Once you dump it out, here comes that same team again, right? DNA polymerase, we fill in the holes, then the ligase clips the last little part of the three prime on that DNA. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. I think in the book, I remember one of these slides, I was like, uh, I wanted to show you that they go into a lot of detail, like this. So in that section, they actually bring up each one of these proteins that are doing this task. Like each one is doing a specific job of either grabbing into a certain piece of DNA, interacting with a specific partner, recruiting a certain thing. When you read through it, appreciate it at the time. This is the big overall story, how these players play out. I don't expect you to memorize these guys, but I do want you to feel comfortable with the ones I color coded on my slides. Yeah, so if you're reading lost, you're gonna, hey, I wanna double check them in the book. I'm gonna leave this off to the side, but I want you guys to stick with this terminology. Yeah? All right. All right, so right now we figured out how we can uh, fix issues. Again, when there's something wrong here on the base screens, we have the wrong letters, which is rid of a piece of DNA. Normally, we're only fixing one piece of strand of DNA. For this part now, we're going to deal with the bigger issue is what happens when we mess with both strands of DNA. So this will be your double-stranded breaks. Right. For this, type 1 is this uh, non-homologous end joint. Um, non yeah, so this one. People love talking about this all the time. They love bringing this up for CRISPR. So if you're ever reading those, the, the, the papers about these guys, for this stuff, they normally write it like this, just N, homologous, non homologous, and join. And APJ. So you're going to see that a lot in the midterms. So I probably won't want to write the whole thing. I'll probably just write that. So make sure on your notes you put it there, right? This is the simplest one. And that double strand it breaks, literally grabs it, glues them back together. That's all it does, right? You're going to have a protein complex that recognizes that, that end of the DNA. The one it'll grab onto one side, the other one will grab onto the other side. They'll basically use these guys to kind of bring it together. They'll glue themselves. For CRISPR, the critical thing here is that 
When you busted a DNA open and it was left free, there's two possibilities. One of them is you're going to have DNases that might start eating away at these base pairs, right? So they'll start making your sequence shorter. Those are called deletions. The other one that could happen too is sometimes you have insertions. So pieces of DNA can actually come into this. Right? So when it breaks, there's a chance that your stuff can either be the exact same size. If things that got deleted, it'll be shorter. If things got inserted, it'll be longer. This is really significant when we're thinking about had this double stranded break happen within the inside of our gene, right? So you imagine you have your DNA like this. Let's say you have your gene here. If you remember, our code says that we need three bases to give us an amino acid, right? So you have your first three, let's say you have your next set. Uh, C, D, G, G. If you split this open, you glue it back together, nothing happens, great. You're still going to have the exact same amino acids, right? If this thing happens and all of a sudden you, you, you're doing deletions, and you get rid of even just one single base pair, when this thing compresses back together, this C will be missing. You can imagine you have two C's, a G gets shifted over. Now we switch that amino acid and everything behind it. Yeah. Same thing with if you do an insertion. So if you insert one base pair, to, sorry, any base pair not a multiple of three, you're going to frame shift it one more time, right? This set of three is going to get shifted forward, and now you're going to mess up your base pair. So if you hit one of our genes with one of these guys, you for sure are going to have busted product at the end. Um, so this one's been pretty good. It's a pretty simple one, just copy paste. And then there, this is the other one. I'm sorry. I do want to add the bottom. So this is the same picture, just a little fancier on this one. Um, now we have the homologous recombination. This is the other way to fix when you have a double-stranded break. Now this is the fancy one, right? This one is almost makes you think of being talked about, like how can we fix something that gets broken um, by using like that information in your body. What this one will do is it'll use another piece of DNA in order to help guide in the way it should get fixed, right? Um, for this one, Ignore this one. I'm going to take this one out, but I'll show you guys through this little chart. It's going through a lot of proteins, but I kind of want you to appreciate how the process gets set up, right? So our dark brown one, that's going to be our broken piece of DNA. This light brown one technically would be like the homologous, the copy on the other chromosome. So if we imagine this is the chromosome that my dad gave me, and the light brown would be the chromosome that my mom gave me. I have mutation and I broke it, I think got broken on my dad's side. What it's gonna do is it's gonna try to get the information from my mom's side to replace the part that I'm missing, right? Cool thing about this, what it'll do is we have this first set of proteins, which are gonna eat away the DNA um, from the five prime side. So they're gonna leave us this little fragment of DNA that's gonna be single strand. That's super important, right? We're gonna use that sequence to basically guide us to the same region in our, in, in my, let's say my mom's gene, right? That'll get us to the other copy. And we'll see this thing setting up. This is first thing, it's called the D loop, right? When that molecule shows up, what it's then gonna do is, it's gonna get, it's, um, we're gonna add this little new section right here. It's gonna be a polymerase coming in, adding these additional base pairs. And technically they're gonna cover the spot that's either missing, if we have deletions, it'll fill in that spot that we're gonna miss from the cutting of it, right? As it's doing that, this will let it become almost like a, um, you can think of it like a template or a primer, but that extra piece of DNA, eventually it's like, if only you got a little bit or a lot, however much we're missing, you see we can use it to kind of clip on back onto my dad's copy. At which point, this, this random event that got cut, I can bring them back together in the proper alignment and orientation, and also the same spacing. Right. So it'll use, let's say, whatever amino acid was here at the arrowhead, you're going to see that that same sequence would have been saved up up here. So we're still keeping the same order. Once it does this, again, more polymerases come in, you synthesize this half, and you synthesize that half. Now that it's going to fill them in, this will be filled in with my dad's information, my dad's information, and this was the information being brought kind of from my mom's side, or what we're using for her to guide this stuff. There, sometimes you can, you can get a little bit of mis mismatching and stuff. For the most part, you should be pretty close. But at the end of the day, when you finish the product here, the cool thing about it is that 
they're likely to have a cleaner product because right? it, it guides itself to be at the right spacing. Sometimes though, it, it does go uh, it does go bad or it does uh, like when the DNA is getting coiled into itself, you have to unravel it apart from each other. In those events, sometimes when you're doing these little crossovers, you end up cutting the DNA. You're supposed to let the loops go through each other. But what ends up happening is you accidentally bring over the fragment. Like instead of bringing back the, the brown one, you accidentally bring the, 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 your mother's copy into your dad's copy, and then it gets transferred over. All right, so you can actually bring in the wrong half as it's trying to uncoil itself. So sometimes it does go bad, but these are actually good in the sense of like they help us evolve stuff. So we can combine information from our different parents' chromosomes. So ours are a little bit mixed in. Yeah. But for the midterm, when I bring these two up, I'm for sure going to stick on this side, thinking about how this is better or like more efficient, more precise than, than, the, than this is the first one I talked about, where you literally just grab the two and pop them together and hope that everything's all right. Yeah. All right. I'm not gonna go that much into the BRCA. Let me take those. All right, any questions for today? Yeah. When you mentioned that the DNA polymerases like add the pairs, does it matter which polymerase it is? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, polymerase two, and I believe, so polymerase two is for bacteria. For us, it's, um, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. So on my table, I have it as if we have a lost space pair, if we have deamination or we have the thymine dimers, um, it's saying DNA polymerase once is the first one, that, it's the one that <coughs> And then um, after that, they also just, they use the same DNA ligase. But I think there's a bunch of different versions of DNA polymerase. Yeah. From last week's talk, you guys feel pretty comfortable, or Tuesday's talk, comfortable with uh, DNA polymerase, one, filling in the gaps. That makes sense to you guys how it has to have double strand DNA. It comes in and you can add one base at a time, go all the way through, but it can't do it again. Yeah. And then by case, lose it. Um, okay, that should be fine. The. So in general, my strategy for all of the for the for the, for the three mechanisms, right? Loss space pair, the deamination, or the thymine dimers. Normally for, for fixing that level of things, and my, my, my steps is I figure out that they have like in general four different steps, but like big overall steps, right? So we do one, two, three, and four. And we're working on your repair side, right? So for these. It's normally you have the protein that detects the DNA. So in this case, it's like like this guy, right? The orange one and the purple one are basically your detectors. They're like, hey, something's wrong with the DNA. You need to do something there, right? At level two. Here, you can have different level of molecules that come into the picture, right? You can call these endonucleases, exonucleases, and you have glycosylases, right? Depending on whether we're working with a lost base pair and a deanimator or thymine, you'll modify which one of these you're gonna use, right? In some cases, like I said, 
it's going to cut here, right? Or the other ones can cut here and here to get rid of just that that base, get rid of that whole phosphate sugar, get rid of the whole thing. Some of them will go and they work further apart so they can cut out a bigger chunk. But at that point, you're going to need to bring in your cutting molecule, right? So this will be endonuclease, it generates cut. Your exonuclease removes damage. And then your glyc um, glycosylase, it cuts the base, or then get yeah, the nitrogen's base, right? Step three, you bring in your DNA pole one. Again, whatever you got rid of, you need to fill in the gap. And in step four, you got to bring in that ligase. Right? So it'd be like you fill in all the holes, then you need to glue that molecule to make it double stranded throughout the whole thing. Yeah. This is the general strategy. I want you to feel comfortable with, with the three different versions, right? Sometimes you're working with a lost base pair. Deamination, where it's like, hey, you lost one of the base, uh, one of the, um, the amine groups, so now your C looks like a U. Or if you have a thymine dimer, which is that DNA is interacting within two neighboring molecules. Yeah? All right, so with these four steps, I want you to go back through these guys, right? This, computer, right? Here, same thing, right? We're going to recognize this up here. We cut off nucleus, <coughs> cut the little base off. We then remove this thing, fill it back in with our, our polymerase, get rid of the ligase. Same thing we're doing here, right? We're recognizing, hey, there's a thymine, it's going to be an issue. Either case opens it up, you cut the chain in the front of the back, polymerase and ligase. Yeah. This one feels like a good storyline. And for this one, I'm gonna, I want to link it up with, the, with talking about the mutations. Remember I told you that NHEJ is sensitive to mutations. You're going to mess things up versus this one, the homologous recombination. You got a better shot of fixing things. Yeah. All right, cool. So fill up your cards. Let me know when you got them. Pass them up. And then uh, you can get behind questions. When we get there.